Welcome back, everybody. It's your boy, Doc Holliday, with another HBCU Overdrive. And today, I have with me Dr. Kenyatta Cavill of the HBCU Sports Lab. Uh, let everybody know. Um, just give a, a, a background of yourself. Oh, certainly. Um, my full-time responsibilities, if you would, are as a professor, I'm a um, full professor, the Interim Associate Dean of Academic Affairs at Texas Southern University. I developed the undergraduate and graduate sport management program, um, the graduate program in sports studies and sports leadership. So I do that among other things. And then I guess uh, in my spare time, if you want to call it that, I'm responsible mm -hmm. for the co-host of Dr. Ville's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab, like you said, and I'm passionate about HBCU sports from all perspectives, uh, particularly in terms of the research, historical, um, and what it means in terms of understanding the business side of sports. Right. And uh, then today, I actually hosted my first uh, Twitter space, and for it to be like almost three hours long, <laughs> it was actually a good thing that I did that um, because if I, I've never done it before. It was my first time. I was trying to see who was going to show up in there. And I was, I was quite astonished that I had over 100 people <laughs> in that space. Um, and it was good banter. It was, it was a good conversation that we had. It was a conversation that we need to have and that we need to continue to have uh, within uh, the HBCU world. It's not just with sports, but also with the culture. Um, and I let people know, like when I tell them about my my channel, is that I deal with the sports and the culture because I just don't want to be just about sports and not get you know and give culture on the on the backside. So I deal with both. And so far, I think I'm doing a good job. <laughs> um, this is my 18th episode that I'm doing since I started my YouTube channel. Uh, I rebranded it. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, I rebranded it in May. I uh, told my wife that I was going to do it. Uh, she was like, she's all for it. She, she is a forward thinker. Um, and she's trying to get me to be a forward thinker. So two forward thinkers on the same page, it, it, you know, saying can't go no wrong. Um, I agree with you. I love to ask you just because we talk about the business side of sports and many times that means content creators in terms of the space that you had earlier, which had right. what many would refer to traditional media, uh, people, journalists, as well as what now seems to be the term they use as kind of new media or certainly more of those content creators from podcasts Twitter blasters, if you would, in mm -hmm. terms of that uh, space. What made you decide and how did you decide on rebranding? Well, I decided on rebranding because um, for one, you know, I, I, I let people know I did go to, ja I went to Jackson State um, mm -hmm. from 1997 to 2001. Then I also went back in 2009. Um, so oh. I've been around. So uh, I've also been to PWI, uh, Stephen L. Faustin in Nacogdoches. Mm. Uh, I was there for about two yep. years. So I know, to me, I know HBCU and PWI. But the reason why I got on there, uh, <laughs> I re it because of Scotty. So, yep. you know, being just going on his show, you know, when he do his live shows and stuff like that, I'm interactive. I'm one of his moderators uh, for his show. Uh, it's okay. like, okay, how about I just do one for myself? And let's see if we can, you know, do a collaboration with just all, you know, all HBCU content creators, not just one person doing this, not just one person doing that. How about all of us come in as a collective whole? And then, you know, I you have Blue. Like that. Uh, you have blue, like he is a FCS encyclopedia. Cause if if it's not for if if I don't know something, I I will go to one of his shows that he does and I will take and I 
and I don't even critique, uh, critique, but I would take bits and pieces of what the information is and then make it, mm -hmm. you know what I say, not making my own, but formulate my own opinion and to get people to do critical thinking. Um, I love it. I love it. And that's what I did with, uh, I had an interview, I, uh, I interviewed Ken, uh, Ken Clark last night. And uh, I wouldn't even call it an interview last night. I call it, it chopping up with the brothers. <laughs> so <laughs> I, that, I, that's what I would call it. I would call it just chopping it up with, with, with people that, you know, that's, that's like-minded and they love sports and they love the culture. So, um, I, you know, I told them about it. I was like, you know what? Uh, I'm going to keep doing this, and uh, I may, be, you know, I, I know they told me not to be say small. <laughs> Cut told me not to say you're a small YouTube creator, but for me to start off with just having like probably like nine or ten subscribers that I had on my channel, and I'm all the way up to like uh, over a hundred right now within like almost two months. That's that's a uh, that's a take for me saying I, I dedicated myself to doing this and also still dedicate myself to doing my regular job <laughs> as a, a store manager for Liz uh, locker room and my real my other real regular job is being a parent <laughs> a you husband, know, being a husband and a parent so I mean I'm, I'm wearing a whole bunch of hats <laughs> in the house and and I'm doing this, and I'm not doing this just for I'm gonna get paid. I'm doing this because I love it. <laughs> there it is. There it is. And so uh, we get it to. I want to get it to what we was all talking about. Um, um, the state of the HBCU football. So I want to go as before we do the for the whole landscape, but I want to do this like what's the state of the swag. Because that's what we can't, you know, we we came in cover from. Um, how do you feel the state of the SWAC is, and what do you think we need to do as far as a conference to improve the conference as a as a whole? Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna take a step back um, and level set and look at where we were. Uh, PC, BC, I should say, before Charles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, with the previous commissioner, and I had uh, covered the SWAC during that time, and so I really and had I, I have the benefit. Let me make sure I share this with folks. I have the benefit of really working, consulting sometimes, or just playing partnerships and journalists from that perspective of working with a lot of the athletic directors, VPs of athletics. Some of the presidents I've come across and had a chance to exchange working with the NCA because of my sports studies degree side, understanding the academy and academic side, as well as the commissioner. So I was able to get my hands on a lot of information that talked about uh, the last two or three years of SWAC where there were some major concerns in terms of the finances. Um, that the, was this with uh, Dua Sharp as the commissioner? Yeah, this would have been with Dua Sharp. Ooh, um, I remember um, him. <laughs> right. As, I mean, uh, he was he was commissioner. Community. Yeah, he was commissioner back in 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 the late nineties. Yeah, he had about a ten year run, um, and he stepped up because before him he was the associate commissioner, mm -hmm. um, with the previous commissioner. So he's been with the league as you talk about for a long period of time. Um, and while there were some things that I think he did that were pretty good, it really went downward fast uh, for him. And again, it was about some of the financial concerns. Okay. People may not realize in a lot of conferences and SWAC MEAC at the FCS level, one of the few FCS conferences where they actually pay out dividends, uh, if you would, if you look at it from a business perspective, at the end of the year, meaning they pay shares, they pay uh, the schools of uh, financial uh, money at the end of the year. So conferences will pay fees at the beginning to become members. And there's usually like annual fees. And then at the end of the year, uh, they do a budget. And if there's money or shares to be provided to the membership, they will pay that out to the members. Right. And for a long period of time, the SWAC was used to getting money. 
that was nominal money. It wasn't like you were going to be able to redesign and create a whole new baseball field and things like that. But right. anytime you get revenue back, you know, it's significant. And oftentimes the revenue back would include the money that you would pay in. So oftentimes the schools would say, you know, hold my fees. And then with our d- distribution fees, just take it out of that. So people at some point, we're not even having to pay in their membership fees, which is at least a benefit uh, with the conference. So it started getting a problem where there wasn't a distribution that there was like, there was no money to distribute to the conference members. And if you are of the FBS level, oftentimes those conferences, because of the television contracts, distribute money. And it varies some of them for $500,000 to what you're hearing now uh, with the SEC in the mm-hmm. Big Ten, where they are about to distribute upwards to a hundred million dollars, so there's yes. a large variance of what that looks like, right? Right. Um, and so, when I talk about it now, long story short, is my understanding: the last couple of years, under Charles, the first year they balanced the book. You know, there was no more red. The conference was not operating the red. That's significant. And then over the last couple of years, there's been a distribution to the SWAC members. Um, and so when I think about that, that means in a lot of ways, financially, talking to the presidents and chancellors, that's significant when you turn around a conference. So I would say the conference is in an upward trajectory. That includes the fact that you have conference expansion uh, with FAMU and Bethune-Cookman. That was major uh, in terms of what that did for the conference, going from 10 members to 12 members, splitting it up, getting one of the blue bloods in HBCU sports in terms of FAMU, probably one of the best operated programs and successful programs in terms of Bethune-Cookman out of the MEAC in terms of the success they had over the last 10, 15 years in terms of football, baseball, softball, uh, to some degree a little bit of their um, men's basketball, but even on their women's basketball, they had just won the MEAC women's championship before they came into the SWAC. So you talk about that, and then you talk about uh, – the trajectory of some of the young athletic directors that were coming in the SWAT, bringing in new blood, new ideas, uh, everywhere from Texas Southern um, with uh, Dr. Kevin Granger uh, okay. coming in and the work that he's done to elevate that program, a basketball program that has done very well in the conference, won two po- the last two uh, NCA tournaments uh, in terms of the opening rounds, which means fin- extra financial benefits for the conference in terms of doing it. Uh, you right. had uh, previously Ashley Robinson that went from Prairie View to uh, Jackson State in terms of what he did with Prairie View, revitalizing in a lot of ways in terms of the new facilities out there, uh, what we see him doing at Jackson State, obviously. Uh, Dr. Travion Scott at Gremlin State, who was assistant at uh, – Southern University uh, in terms of what was going on there with their athletic director. Um, and so Alabama State in terms of uh, a lot of the moves. So you've seen a lot of young blood that coming here making very good changes. And obviously at Alabama State, that's Jason Cable that was right. in the SWAC office uh, doing a lot of good work there. And so I thought I saw that as a trajectory going up in the final upward trajectory, I in so many different ways was with Coach Prime at Jackson State University and what he's done to elevate that football, the overall platform, providing even more interest to the conference for folks um, that were not necessarily as interested before, if at all. I just see the conference in an upward trajectory. Even the conversations that talk about the conference uh, with the inclusion of FAMU, looking at potentially making a move as a conference of FBS level. I thought that is significant uh, in terms of where the conference is going. Yeah, so when you talk about like conference movement, conference shaking, you know, we we look at the SWAC, um, which is 102 years old. Um, you talk about the, you know, the origins of the SWAC, the, the, the Bible schools, the six Bible schools in one public institution, which was Prairie View. Um, and you see a lot of movement and shaking that was going on from the time that it started all the way up until now. Um, it's not like the swag has ever been um, just like to be still 
and just to have the, the original whatever or or the team the schools that's in the conference now like are the original but if you go you know people have to go back and see like okay you we had these church schools <laughs> All of them right. funded by the AME church or by some sort of uh, religious uh, denomination. And then you have Prayer View, which is basically uh, uh, the little brother of uh, the three schools in, you know, in the state of Texas that's in the state constitution. Um, some people don't even read, you know, people don't even think about that, read about that as far as like, okay, why is Prayer View in our state constitution? It was written in there. <laughs> if, if you talk about they was founded That's after right. Reconstruction, <laughs> you know, so you have to you you have to kind of put it in there, like, hey, this school is only going to be for for newly freed slaves in the state. Um, they're going to do such such thing, and we going to give you Texas A and M, <laughs> and then then a couple of years down the line, you got University of Texas. So um, people, I, I kind of just go through and I even tell my wife, like when I talk about the swag and she'd be like, you know too much. I'm like, no, nah, I just read. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I just read like, I'm, I'm, I just read and kind of go through and see what's up. But um, so now we're going to get into the state of HBCU football. So I'm talking about- Before you do that, I, I think the history that you talk about is extremely important. So um, I did want to share that. So you talked about those founding members of the SWAC mm -hmm. and it was all a state, one state. Yeah, it was the Texas. whole entire SWAC, Texas, mm -hmm. uh, which you talked a little bit about the history, which is extremely important. So when you're talking about the founding of the SWAC, it's coming out of the era of the Civil War, right? Right. At the end of that, uh, you're having segregation, Jim Crow laws, right. essentially apartheid of the United States, uh, where you have enslaved Africans that literally fought for their freedom, have gained it. Um, but you have this football among the sports of baseball that is really taking off in the country in a lot of ways, right? Right. Um, and it's played by collegiate institutions namely out of the east, but it's now it's moving through the south, coming southwest, and eventually goes midwest all the way to the west. Right. And so you have these historically black colleges, these institutions that are moving in an upward trajectory that are wanting to educate uh, these newly, uh, no longer enslaved Africans um, that are using that terminology at the time. Now we use black um, after coming through the Negro uh, coin terminology, right? Or mm -hmm. African-Americans and Blacks as we look at it. And so you have these uh, institutions, Samuel Houston, um, out of the Austin area, as we know now, Houston Tillerson University. You have right. Paul Quinn College, one of the first institutions that leads. Um, you have Texas College, Wiley College, right? Which at the first decade of the SWAC, dominated not only the SWAC, but dominated HBCUs. In their early years, the HBCU national champions were all these private institutions, right? Bishop College. Uh, which Wiley College was one of the main frames of that. Howard University, um, Tuskegee, as we still know, is a well-branded institution, right? And so it's fascinating when you talk about the collection of these institutions, with the one public institution being Prairie View College, later renamed university in the 1970 when a lot of universities throughout the SWAC moved from college designation uh, to university designation outside of Texas Southern University, 1927, eventually becoming a state institution in uh, 1947 uh, that mm -hmm. always had the designation of Texas Southern University. It was a Texas State for the Negroes uh, for a while before it was rebranded in terms of Texas Southern University. Um, so you talk about these institutions as the private institutions move out. And a lot of that was done uh, because of World War II uh, when the GI Bill came in and you had a lot of African-Americans going to school that now had financial means to do it. And right. the private institutions could not grow 
in the same rate and therefore could not keep up in terms of the athletic prowess that they once had on the football field. And they decide to move out of the swag and find their own way in the other way. And ultimately, many of them drop the sport of football. Uh, but to your point, um, the conference always had a lot of churning is the academic term we use for it. Uh, when you talk about historically black college and what I refer to as historically white colleges to provide the equality between the two institutions instead of using right. what a lot of people use in terms of fraternity white, um, uh, which is just the framing that I tend to use, whatever uh, people want to use is fine. But I say all that one last thing I want to say though, up until that last expansion, right, conference training in 1999 and 1998, um, when Alabama AM and University of Arkansas Pine Bluff, that was once in the SWAC that left at that time was Arkansas AM, AM and N, right? Right. Uh, when they were previously run back, SWAC was the longest seating conference that had stability with no conference churning until this late one after 100 years when we closed out with FAMU and Bethune Cookman coming into the university. So great points you make when you talk about the dichotomy of the SWAC going from just a state run conference essentially that right. now covers literally Texas to Florida with all the states in between, including Arkansas in terms of running the Gulf of the deep South and Southwest, Southeast part of the right. United States. So, um, so like I said, we're going to get like the state of HBCU football. So I'm talking about SWAC, MEAC, CIAA, SAIC, Tennessee State. Certainly. And, uh, A&T. Um, what's, what's another school I'm missing? That's Hampton. Hampton. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and all the, all the other schools that's, <clears throat> that's kind of coming along. How do you see as far as as a whole as HBCU football as a whole? How do you see that coming about um, like going on right now and in the down in the near future? I think uh, I think it's on the upward trajectory as well. I mean, obviously, the one question you would have a little bit about the MEAC, but I think there's some things that you can point in that shows that they're also pretty strong as well. But let me start with the SIAC. SIAC has had a major expansion and churning, which tells you the health of the league. They brought in Allen University, Edward Waters University, that transitioned from NEIA to the NCAA Division II, which is yes. where the SIAC operates their program, right? When football, they give 36 uh, scholarships instead of the 63 allowed at the FCS level um, versus the 85 at the FBS level, which many people uh, understand a little differential in terms of basketball scholarship limits, men, men and women. But with that being said, you have Allen University. And the big thing is both of them just last week were sanctioned in terms of qualifying to continue to move forward with their transition as right. they move in the SIC, completing their second year of transition and were graded appropriately. Um, and so now they can compete for at least a regular season championship. So right. you see a SIC that has had growth, including Central State coming into the league. So I think in a lot of ways, you see positive growth there. You see the ESPN contract that they have that are putting their games on television. Um, you see the Red Tail Classic, which opens up the season. And yes. They broadcast Tuskegee in the last couple of years for Valley State. So I think in a lot of ways, you see some very sound growth in the SIC. Uh, you had Apple Waters. Um, a lot of the teams, Albany State, having strong baseball programs, uh, played for the HBCU National Champion with Edward Waters winning out of the NIA side. Um, you see, also, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the Gulf Coast Athletic Conference to back up just a little bit uh, mm -hmm. at the NIA level that happens to be now a conference that are made up of all HBCUs. They just had major expansion uh, when they had expansion of Wiley College moving from the Red River Athletic Conference into the Gulf uh, South uh, Athletic Conference. They brought in Knoxville College, uh, another institution as well, as they continue to grow. Suno has come back uh, um, where they uh, had to drop athletics. They're now bringing back athletics, right? right? So, And the last thing I will say about those conferences, that also another measure of strength, is you got programs like Dillard that are bringing back baseball. Okay. Uh, in terms of the conference. Um, 
while the college had baseball. So now they're going to be offered baseball. And in a lot of ways, you've heard a lot of HBCU programs at the Division One level that have dropped baseball and even to some degree in the CIAA that dropped baseball, which brings me to the CIAA, uh, which also is becoming strong in terms of what they've done with their move, with their basketball, which many people are very aware of the CID, CIAA basketball tournament that recently moved from Charlotte to Baltimore and yeah. everything that is associated with that has said that it's very strong. Now they dropped baseball, which did a little bit of a, a little bit of a concern, but Virginia State still plays baseball at the Division II level. So uh, the commissioner, Jackie McWilliams, has been strong in terms of financially getting support uh, where they're driving scholarships from the basketball tournament, which they've been able to turn into revenue for the member institutions. But that's been very strong. And the last one, I'll take you to the MEAC um, in terms of them being able to hold steady. Many people have put dirt on the MEAC. Most yeah, they, they try to talk about it being buried, right? That Howard was gone. And T obviously had left with FAMU and Bethune Cookman. There were questions about whether Delaware State was going to leave, but she was able to hold on to those institutions. And one thing I'm not sure that people recognize when you talk about the financial benefits, which a lot of decisions don't do, um, they were getting the same NCA money right? Mm -hmm. That would be split between 11 institutions. Now they're splitting that basketball money between eight institutions. Right. So the slice of cut that they get is large enough, uh, which right. you asked uh, athletic director or um, a president, chancellor, they would appreciate it. Obviously, you know what they were able to have success in the celebration bowl, having pretty much success in the MEAC SWAC challenge over the last couple of years. Right. So in a lot of ways, you can argue that there's some strong things going on with the MEAC I think they obviously need to have some foundation strengths in terms of being able to regrow that conference. And some people are talking about whether that is coming out of the CIAA or even maybe the SIEC. Um, but until the NCA updates this transformation uh, committee findings at the division one level of what it will be meaning for those institutions that decide to transition, mm -hmm. I think that's gonna slow some things down. But once that is updated, uh, by the end of the summer, you probably will see uh, some different admittance in terms of the program. They were able to find uh, a home for those sports, uh, for baseball, men's and women's golf, where they partner with the North Conference, where those schools can still have access to an automatic bid to the NCAA tournament, uh, which was a significant deal to come up. So I think you put all that together and you see the strengths. You see Tennessee State that obviously hired Eddie George, so there's a lot of momentum going in. We'll right. see about this season. What does that mean? Obviously, they had a big game uh, in Memphis uh, with the Southern Heritage Classic. There's some updates and changing in terms of Jackson State moving forward about no longer participating in games. So it's going to be interesting to see what that looks like. Right. We have the, the athletic director over there at Tennessee State along with the coach that are talking about moving to FBS. You also see that over a period of time with North Carolina a and they've put that on the table, but they moved from the Big South to the Colonial Athletic Association. And if you talk to anybody over there, they believe that's a significant move uh, along with Hampton uh, taking their steps over there. So it'll be interesting to follow to see what that looks like. So I think you see HBCUs taking different paths, different, different trajectories that fit for their institution. So, um, when you put all that together, I think the health of HBCU conferences in terms of the athletic uh, platform has been very strong. The last thing I'll add, for the most part, you've seen growth in terms of enrollment, which is always a positive and strong indicator. Um, there's always the need for additional funding. Um, right. And that's because the cost of education in this country continues to go up. That's a whole different uh, discussion we can have. Um, and I know it's far beyond what we were originally going to talk about, but I just wanted to paint a full picture right. of what your question was, the state of HBC sports. Okay. Yeah. And I also like to congratulate uh, Jarvis moving up status from college to university also, and with the wrestling program. So that's a big, that's a big deal. Absolutely. Great that's point. a big deal for that school right there. Um um, so, and people don't realize when you go from college to university academically, 
usually what that means is now you have a college that is offering graduate programs. Traditionally, right. it means at the master's level and those degrees. So you go to your accrediting body, which in the South would be the Southern uh, Accreditation, SAC, COC. Mm -hmm. um, and if you are showing them that you have developed these programs, uh, then you have the ability to petition to move from that college to university status, which you can imagine is a great branding recognition. We yeah. talked about Edward Waters. They were also another one of those institutions that moved from Edward Waters College uh, to, to Edward Waters, Waters University. University. A couple of years ago was Houston Tillerson. It was previously Houston Tillerson College. Now, uh, over the last couple of years, pretty people have seen them rebrand themselves as Houston Tillerson University. So great point. Great point. I'm yep. hearing Miles and College is on the same trajectory to look at making that move. So oh, okay. I think in a lot of ways, HBCUs are... Uh, up and coming in terms of continue to what I call past, present, and persistence. And, and, and let's get one more congratulations for Morris Brown getting their accreditation back and getting out of the red. They in the black, and I hope that they can go back to not before, not what they was before all the scandal happened with the financial aid and stuff but to get back to the point where they was on top, you know, they was the school to, you know, everybody wanted to go to, um, even seeing the, you know, the, you know, the Morris Brown College marching band, the marching Wolverines, you know, I like watching them. I'm a band nerd. So, <laughs> uh, I like watching them and, and, you know, that kind of piqued my interest about Morris Brown. Um, uh, so I'm glad that they get they got their stuff back together. That um, they have a capable uh, administration with a, with a very highly dedicated president that is running the show at that school. So let's hope that they yeah, we hadn't seen anything like that since Alcorn College College when they lost their accreditation. Yeah, lost they accreditation. Build it back up and get it up. And now you've seen Morris, Morris Brown literally get off the floor and uh, rise like a phoenix. So it is significant to see that for the Wolverines. Yeah, so um, so it was a, a, a question. I watched this uh, 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 podcast. It was Desi Banks, and he had Coach Prime on there. And um, Coach Prime came in, and he said, and it stuck with me. It's been stuck stuck with me for since I watched it, that uh, that podcast. He said that we need to stop doing bad business practices. And I want you to get your. I want to get your understanding. Of what you know, in on your way of thinking, what he meant by that. Right, and I don't know exactly what he meant by that, but I can speak uh, from this perspective. Um, usually when you talk about bad business practices, you're talking about things that are not done um, in what a modern traditional way is being done. Mm -hmm. um, and so obviously one may be uh, what he was referencing uh, at that time in a lot of ways uh, was based on the Southern Heritage Classic and the financial agreement. And so I think Coach Prime has had a great deal of experience on multiple levels. So he is brilliant about understanding his brand right. and the value of branding in itself, which is one of the things we talk about in our sports studies class. And everybody has a brand. Every institution has a brand. Right. And a lot of people don't realize the fact that they are a brand. So I tell all my students to understand that you have a brand. And as you move through life and continue your trajectory through college, uh, right. Higher education is you need to start perfecting your brand and what you want it to stand for, because you can monetize your brand. So I think in a lot of ways, what um, Coach Prime likes to challenge, uh, what some people would call the status quo, is challenging people to understand the value of their brand. Right. Right. And how do you make sure that you um, get that value that is deserved to your brand. I've always challenged athletics and the athletic directors, vice president that I've had a chance to work with is to do the homework in calculating your brand value. 
Once you calculate your brand value, it's easier when you go to negotiate uh, what you understand and what you're willing to walk away from. Because all deals are not great deals, but you have to understand what that value is. And oftentimes, if people have told you that you have no value, right? Right. As an institution or a person, um, that will become self efficacy right? And you tend to internalize it. And if you're not careful, you won't push the limits of your brand and you'll accept anything. And I think in a lot of ways, those are some things that he's talking about. The other okay. things I think he's talking about is just general on campus, the operation. And I think that is a challenge because oftentimes from an institution where you need to push forward about putting your best foot forward and making sure that you provide the quality, but we cannot escape the fact that HBCUs, black institution in general, have a been uh, at a deprivation of resources. You talked about earlier the state uh, in regards to the history of how HBCUs came to be founded. They were founded because Historically, white colleges would not accept African Americans or formerly enslaved Africans into their institutions. So they created these other institutions. Well, we know that you had the Plessy versus Ferguson decision that ultimately legalized separation. And it was based on the fact that everything was supposed to be equal. But we know in terms of studying history that it has never been equal in terms of resources. And so right. that's why I use the terminology of understanding the deprivation of resources. And that's been a story. And if you don't have resources, oftentimes it is a real challenge to do business in an appropriate manner. So I think there has to be a balance to understanding that we can and must do better, but we also must understand what are the forces and vices that have created the environment that oftentimes have institutions operating below what is the norm for the resources they should have. Okay, man, man that that that's a lot to take in, but I mean that's what we need. Um, so now coming on to the YouTube scene, and you have content, you have creators like Allscript. Uh, where he's challenging, like you said, he's challenging the status quo, like with the contracts, the contracts that we have with the Southern Heritage Classic, the contracts that you have with the Bayou Classic, maybe the contracts that we have with ESPN. How do we try to get ourselves out of these bad deals and to make sure we know what our, you know what I'm saying, what our value is? Well, I I think the first thing is we have to make sure that actually are bad people. Um, and so we have to be careful to assume that all the deals that we're in are, are bad. Um, because sometimes at the time the deal was constructed or made, it may actually be a good deal, right? right? Then over a period of time, the value has changed. The cost of doing business now is not the cost of doing business 10 years ago. Right. Um, and a contract is a contract. So you need to be very careful about um, understanding what happens if you break a contract. Now, depending on the clause in the contract, it may be very valuable to break the contract. The money you can get on another contract may uh, pay for the cost of, that you broke the contract. So right. that's one way to do with it. But let's take an example outside of this that many people should be familiar with. Many people are suggesting that the ACC contract that they signed with ESPN is a bad contract. Right. Now they're talking about it's a bad contract now. When they signed the deal, it was actually a pretty damn good contract. Right. Right. Because they had their own network. Because of how long, exactly, had their own network, uh, which they were becoming one of the few conferences that had their own network, one of the two or three Power Fives that had their own network, which in a lot of ways was the thing that was going on at the time. It was the newest thing, right? It was state of art. It was in an upward trajectory. Um, it was the nuance in terms of how you do business. Now, the length of the contract um, has made it antiquated now because uh, other contracts have come to an end, namely the SEC and 
we know where they are going with their new contract, right? The Big right. Ten in terms of what is being said they're going to do, which essentially is a billion dollars contract much like the SEC that's going to pay each member around a hundred million dollars right while the ACC is just getting 15 million dollars so those are the unique things that that need to be considered you know are you saying the contract is bad when it was signed are you saying the contract is bad now and particularly I think it's important to point out what is actually bad about the contract is it the years right. is it the way it's passed out is it the overall financial numbers what specifically about the contract is bad is it bad in terms of who is getting the money because there's many people that have a philosophy in terms of hbcus which is something that we really need to dissect because it is important in terms of the conversation and i think many people on both sides would make an argument in which direction we should go um the way universities are financed in terms of athletics is 70 to 90 percent of the budget for athletics comes out of the general fund from the institution, meaning the institution upfronts that money essentially at the beginning of the year. And then based on game guarantees, NCA money, ticket sales, um, advertising, dollars, sponsorship, that money is paid back to the university. Right. right. Many people don't realize that other than the power fives and just the top few of those now with these new contracts, many of them all should start generating revenue in the positive. But that but previous to this, just about all universities athletic budgets ran in a deficit at best, right. at best they would run even. So the model that we use for college athletics says that these teams run and operate in a deficit. But let me get back to some of the final points of the contract that that oftentimes um, is concerning in terms of the money associated with coming in. The question becomes is, again, do you understand your brand value and did you negotiate the best deal in terms of where your brand is? And so I think those questions are fair in terms of they should be asked. But a lot of times the point is to make sure that you have all the information necessary to really debate a good and bad contract okay okay because you know i want to get into you know trying to figure out like what what the contract like what the outlier outliers of a contract is what makes it good what makes it bad um so uh there's this thing as far as what we call right now is the dip with tradition versus money how you feel about that <laughs> <laughs> oh i love that conversation and i usually don't get into it but i think uh, you caught me in terms of a, a great interview question i think one of the questions that, that and this is where you're going to have to forgive me for being an academic it's right. challenging for me to have conversations like this is because we set no boundaries my first question is is how are you defining tradition Right, because we have people just throw out words: culture, tradition, HBCU culture. Shoot, I even coined my own term: HBCU sports culture. But as an academic, when I put it in the paper, I have to define. It. Right. So I'll define what it is: the sporting HBCU diaspora. And when I open my show, I say those terms, uh, but I don't think people realize that I literally have defined what that means. So once I tell you a definition then I think we can enter in dialogue. If not, what we're having is just discussion. Right. First off, oftentimes what we see uh, jargon go on in the social media platform, it just turns into debate. And we have no rules the way that we're debating in the social media platform. Just right. about anything goes, even name calling, which is not something that I would yeah. like to be part of. But nah. I understand <laughs> it's the wild, wild west. And it is what it is in social media. But I think those are the things that we need to really understand. Are we entering into a dialogue where there's really going to be information going back and forth, where there's going to be meaningful uh, discussion in regards to whatever we're putting in the terminology in front of us? Or right. are we just having a discussion where people are throwing stuff out? Or is this a debate where I'm trying to prove a point or prove you wrong um, in terms of that? So. 
I would ask the question, really before we get into the discussion, how are we defining tradition? Last thing I will say though, I think in context that is important for us to get out of here. It is important to understand your history or you are bound to repeat it. We've heard that said all the time. So right. if you're talking about tradition in terms of history, I think part of that tradition is extremely important. Now it doesn't mean somebody like myself that loves innovation and strategic planning. It doesn't mean that you need to be prepared to understand the landscape of what you, where you're operating and how do you move past it. I think that is extremely important that we cannot allow tradition not to allow you to be innovative, not to allow you to be creative, right? And move right. the needle in terms of driving revenue. But we also must understand what that means in terms of all the different parameters that are in place. Sometimes we'll have discussion about things and we have no parameters in terms of cause and effect. What does it mean from one side to the other? So I'll boil it all down in terms of me saying that, generally speaking, I believe tradition is extremely important, but it should not be at the expense of you not allowing your institution or as an individual to be innovative. Right. Okay. Um, and um, we're going to get into that TSU football. Uh, I had a chance to, uh, uh, last month, to interview uh, Jack Nance. <laughs> Uh, starting the center for the football team and he's basically he um basically told me that he's loving the team that they have now with the recruiting that they did this uh past spring um and with the growth and development of andrew body now for us being in texas because i live in dallas <laughs> um, there you go you don't, you, nobody never heard who Andrew Body was until he got the TSU. I didn't even know, you know, when I was doing my research, I did not even, I didn't even know that he was the fifth leading passer in Texas high school football history. So that meant that this man yeah. is better than Gary Gilbert that won two state championships with Lake Travis. He's better than, um, um, hey, what's that guy name? I forgot. He used to play for Navasota. That guy, he's better than him. Um, you mean to tell me he's better than Graham? He's better than you know Graham Harrell. He's better than most of these guys that you that you would know about. You know, as far as with high school football, and he did it so quietly in <laughs> in Corpus, in Corpus Christi of all places. He did it so quietly. And then when he gets to, uh, to TSU, um, he gets in the game because I remember, uh, Coach McKinney sits down Jalen Brown because he was the projected right. starter. And um, it's the world of Andrew Body now. And how do you feel about the football team that you see now compared to what it was uh, like a couple of years ago? Yeah, I think they're in uh, up the trajectory, particularly on the offensive side of the ball. Some of the questions, Marks, I have is more on the defensive side. So I'm fascinated to see what goes in this season. I think Texas Southern is probably one of the under, most underrated teams in the conference outside of maybe Mississippi Valley State, the Delta Devils over there. Yes. Um, but to your point, you out of Dallas and you know how big football is in the state of Texas, one. But oh, you yes. certainly know how big it is in, in, in the city of Dallas and the greater Metroplex, as they like to call it out there, as well as Houston. So one of the things that uh, hurt Andrew Body is the fact that he played outside of those regions of right. Dallas, Houston, and to some degree, even San Antonio. So Corpus Christi is kind of a hidden place that doesn't necessarily get the coverage. And some people uh, were a little bit down in terms of his height. But we see that Body is talented. I had him as a finalist for my ben, Big Ben HBCU football award, which is giving at the end of the year to all uh, players that are, uh, play at HBCUs are connected with the state of Texas, meaning they play a high school football in Texas or born in Texas, Right. which is another thing that's going to be interesting in terms of this football season. We have four state of Texas uh, football quarterbacks that are playing, Alabama State, Demetrius Davis, it mm -hmm. comes out of Houston, North Shore, which you're right. very familiar. 
That's oh, obviously ooh. played against Duncanville out of the greater Dallas area. Yeah, it still hurts. Policy, <laughs> and some of the wars that you had between those two programs for state championships at the highest level. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, obviously, you have Andrew Body and Shador Sanders who um, took up the storm. And one of the reasons you probably hadn't heard more about Body is because as a freshman, uh, how much Sanders uh, was able to get. Rightfully so in terms of what Jackson State program and the uh, football branding that we talked about Coach Prime is able to do. Uh, but to your point, I think Texas Southern uh, has a chance to take the conference by storm. And they start out with the Labor Day Classic, which they have not been able to get over the hurdle against the right. Panthers for the like, uh, last couple of years. So that quarterback um, matchup between Conley and Body is going to be fascinating to watch between uh, these two programs to open up the season in terms of the Labor Day Classic that will be played at Prairie View. But uh, you have the offensive lineman who allows things to get going right for Andrew right. Body, which is Drake Sinners. He was an all-conference pick at the guard, and he anchors the, this veteran group. So this is a very veteran offensive line. You remember in terms of following Jackson State, in terms of the first half of that game, that was a 21-21 game. Yeah. A couple of late turnovers, right, in terms of the fourth corner. And Jackson State did what they were able to do, seemed like all year long, is really close, strong in the fourth quarter, other than what happened against South Carolina State. Linebacker, what we talking a little bit, it'll be interesting to see can they take their next step. Is Terry Cooper, in terms of what he's able to do, you know, a little bit uh, under – um, size in a lot of ways when people are talking about what is he going to be able to do. But then he has this back to the offensive side. You have a tight end, Duran Johnson. Um, okay. You have a couple of newcomers on uh, the list. Um, and you have the ability also what uh, body gives you is not only can he do it with his arms, but he can also do it with his legs. Right. Um, in this conference, um, that's something for a player to extend plays. We've seen that for multiple years. Uh, with Alcorn, the Braves, with Felix, the cat, uh, yep. which was hell to get him on the ground in so many different ways. <laughs> and how many plays that he just uh, allowed his team to continue to play for. And this was with a line that wasn't very good. So I'm interested to see. Obviously, they lost Michael Bandejo, who was a stalwart on their defense. Uh, that yeah. you had some question mark, but he really gave him a lot. Can the defensive end like the Mon- uh, Monterio? Anderson, a couple of wide receivers that were transferred that came into Texas Southern University that's been working out uh, out of Miami, uh, where you know a lot of talent it comes from, coming out of Middle Tennessee State as a transfer. Hmm. So I think Texas Southern could be one of those teams that could be a very surprise. I think those first two games, though, uh, in terms of conference games, are going to tell you everything you need to know about the Tigers as they open up the season. Right, you right. have Prairie View Indian Panthers, and then they go back up to Arlington, uh, where they defeated and really started the swoon of Southern University. It seems last season you have that rematch with the Southern Jaguars. Obviously, they got the new coach that came from Prairie View over there. Uh, the Golden Child has come home, but I think those two games will tell you a lot about these Tigers. If they're able to take care of business here, watch out for the rest of the season for the Tigers. They could surprise everybody. So it's going to be fascinating to see uh, what takes on there. So that matchup between Prairie View, uh, new coach over there, Bubba McDowell, Bubba McDowell, obviously the Houston Oilers that came from the yeah. that a lot of people in Prairie View excited about. Um, people hadn't talked much about running backs in the SWAC because the arms are so loaded. Even with Skylar Perry over there at, uh, at Pine Bluff, you know, we know a lot about the quarterbacks, it seems like. But you have a running back, Jaden Stewart. Um, he is solid. Okay. Keep your eyes on what he's able to do. The freshman down there, he was solid last year. He's come back stronger and more talented. You have a line. You have to replace the center a little bit, but that line is pretty solid at Prairie View. They're going to like the one that run the ball, which is a little different in this conference, so it's going to be fascinating to see what's going on there. They have some missing pieces that they lost on the defensive side. Uh, they lost Jason Dumas. Inside right. run stuffer was the heart of that defense other than Drake Cheatham that has went to Kansas State as a portal transfer. Uh, Jason Dumas has went over there to Southern. 
Right. He matches up with the defensive end 2020, uh, 21 spring player, defensive Jordan player Lewis. In terms of FCS. Jordan Lewis. Think about that defensive line. And they have some other guys mixed in there. They got the transfer from Bowie State on at the cornerback position. That yeah. Southern defense may be the most improved in the conference. And if you are in the Western Division, I think you need to be uh, concerned about the Southern defense. We'll find more about the offensive side of the ball, but if you know anything about Dooley, he tends to be able to find some offensive scoring power no matter what he is. So you put right. those two things, it's scary to be there. Obviously, uh, Gramlin State is trying to reload, rebuild, and the State Fair Classic between Prairie View and Gramlin. They're trying to get off the side. They hadn't been Prairie View in a number of years, and they think this is their year. Defense, right. people forget. Defense, Gramlin was extremely strong last year. They can get anything on the offensive side of the ball. They're going to find themselves right back in the picture. So it's fascinating. That's the West. Obviously, with all corn sliding over there, what are they going to do to replace Felix? I'm fascinated to see what that is. They have Cedric Thornton on the defensive side yep. that has transferred to Gramlin, so you think they're going to be stronger. But then they brought in Cedric uh, Thomas that comes back from previous being the head coach at Pine Bluff that really built them in terms of, in many ways, of what we saw in the spring when they made the championship game. Um, so that's going to be fascinating to see as he comes back on the defense that after a short stint at the junior college, what can he do on that defensive side? The Braves are really talented and really go when they're able to stop you on defense and run right. the ball on offense, and you think they're going to continue to try to do that. Pine Bluff is going to find a way to get better. They got a senior quarterback. They got some playmakers. People are not looking at Pine Bluff, and that's usually when they're the most dangerous, when you forget about them. Let's yeah, that Pine, the that, that Pine Bluff team, the last season's Pine Bluff team, it kind of – you you we had high, high expectations for them because of what they did in the spring season, and you know they let games get away from them. Uh, especially, I think when it came right. down to when they played Alcorn, they had the lead, and then Alcorn came back and won. Yeah, they like, were never they were never the same after that. Right, exactly right. Everybody thought they should have won that game. Uh, you had the heart of a champion in the Braves. And they just didn't stop in that second half. The wheels started going downhill, as they said, and they uh, ran them out of there. And Pine Bluff just could not recover. They took up and went down to Prairie the next weekend and were playing a Prairie View team that was feeling good about themselves, uh, right. pushed them around. And you're right, they just never recovered. So I'm fascinated to see in terms of what uh, Doc is going to be able to do, gamble in terms of Pine Bluff. He knows and his expectation. They quietly didn't work. And again, I think that's the team that plays best when they're leading from. So they're back into their usual position where mm -hmm. nobody's paying attention to them. And I think that's when they're at their worst. You go over the East. The East is just the uh, beast, as they say. Yes, it, it is deep. Many people just look at FAMU and Jackson State. But I think Alabama A&M um, is going to be right there. Um, I feel like – the real go ahead. I feel like after whenever whoever wins the Jack State Pam U game, but when whoever beats whoever wins the Gold Coast Classic, um, Jack State and Alabama AM, which I dub the pink scooter game, <laughs> uh, whoever wins that game, <laughs> yeah. has, they have the, the they have the, the the leading track to win the East Division. But I'm gonna, yep. like you said, I'm Absolutely. gonna, I, I'm gonna pivot and and look at Valley because Valley is a determined team, and they want to show people that they're not no pushovers anymore. And I like what Coach Dancy is doing over there. Oh, but he's solid. It, 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 Dancy is solid. Resources. That defense, people don't realize that was the best back six, seven, if you would. Yeah. In terms of that, in the league, in terms of what they were able to lead the lead the conference interceptions. You know, everybody thought they could just throw the ball around on them. Um, their only thing is to see if they can score a little bit. If they can score a little bit, and they got one of the best JUCO quarterbacks that transferred in there. Um, so if they can put up some points, oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah. Valley will be a whole different team. Um, and I think they're going to be solid. They're going to give some pro, uh, people some problems. The schedule is really tough in a lot of ways, so it'll be fascinating to see how that looks. 
And well, they got Charlton State at the there. beginning of the year. Yeah, at the beginning of the year. And I'm always one of those folks that talk about non-conference games really set the course. And a lot of folks believe that you can just kind of turn it on once you get in the conference. That's one of the things that concern me also with Prairie. They have an extremely mm-hmm. tough conference schedule as well, playing uh, Incarnate Word yeah. right early in the season. Obviously, uh, they played a rival to open up the season. Um, and then they also have – Stephen M. Austin in regards to, um, in terms of what that looks like in, in terms of that matchup. So it's fascinating in terms of what that looks like. So a concern in a lot of ways in terms of what's going on there. But back a little bit to the East, uh, Alabama mm-hmm. and Edward Maynard. Uh, they brought over a defensive coordinator that he went to a semifinals and a championship uh, at the Division II level. I'm talking about NCAA championship, right? Right. Coming out of Wilson State. So I think they're going to be much improved for defense. They had the most transfers to anybody, taking the model of what you saw uh, Coach Prime did. Maynard's talked about, well, if I'm going to play with these guys, we got to do something similar. Uh, right. And so he's done that. He's like, uh, in a lot of ways, he's like Dooley. He's always been able to find a quarterback that can be a trigger man. So I'm not right. concerned with the fact that he's lost glass. I think in some ways he may be able to do some things that he – uh, was not able to do with glass in terms of maybe having a little more mobility at the quarterback position in terms of some of the guys that he has in there that he's looking at. I, I'm also really curious because you said it about the Gulf Coast Classic. That game moves from being a home game in Jackson where I think it would have been much more challenging for Alabama A&M to come in and win that game. I think right. they have a better chance playing in a neutral site. So to me, that makes that game a little more – intriguing than it would have been without it. So, again, I'm fascinated in terms of what that looks like in terms of that matchup. Uh, Alabama State, I told you about Demetrius uh, in terms of he's the real deal. People don't realize how talented he was. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Auburn to transfer over. They also got a running back now, the transfer from Delaware State. That uh, was all conference up there. So they're putting something together. Now they lost the defensive coordinator uh, to Morgan State that right. was, was led – um, the Bowie State Bulldogs uh, to uh, quarterfinal run in terms mm-hmm. of the Division II tournament. So I think that may be some something that hurts them a little bit in terms of what they thought they were putting together down there. So I'm fascinated to see what that looks like. And then Jackson State, um, obviously, the thing that you think about Jackson State, they're going to have a lot of talent. Um, right. No question about it. The only question is, is can Coach Prime make sure that they don't get the big head to some degree, you might have saw that in the celebration bowl with South Carolina State, which you hope provides them with a little bit of hunger, that they want to finish the business that they didn't do last year. But I right. think that's the question. Uh, do they have any letdown games? You know they're going to be red fam you uh, in terms of that. You know they're going to be ready for Alcorn. They're going to be ready for Valley in terms of those key matchups. Uh, but we'll, they'll, get, they'll be ready for Southern, right? Right. Obviously they'll be ready for Grambling. That's, right. that's five games. They're going to be up for homecoming with Campbell. That's six games. Yep. Can you get up every weekend during the season uh, for some of these matchups that may not be uh, as exciting for you? Texas Southern University. I think they'd be ready for it because you got two, arguably the youngest quarterbacks going at it, two of the um, arms of the SWAC. Uh, so I'll be fascinating with that matchup. Obviously in Houston. So that's fascinating. You play yeah. um, Bethune-Cookman. Now that's going to be in Jacksonville for a classic game. Yes, He's sir. Got a tough non-conference game against Tennessee State, uh, where obviously everybody's going to be up. So to me, the talent is not the issue. Coaching is not the issue with Jackson State. Their ability to play up to the standard that they have now set, to me, is going to be the question. Because you know they're going to get everybody's best shot. Right. They're going to get everybody's best shot. You know, everybody's going to want to come in that game because if they can get that game, they can feel like they're making a statement um, and they can make it level. So that's the kind of thing that questions me about Jackson State. I think they're still going to get it done, but I'm fascinating if they get a bump in the road. It's going to be more about their inability um, as players to play up every week. They're going to – coaches are going to guard against it. Yeah. All right, man, Mr. Dr. Kavir, that was an interesting conversation that we had. I don't even think it was an interview. I think it was a conversation, you know, that, that needed to be heard. 
Um, but let everybody Thank know you. where they can catch you on, on YouTube. Certainly. You can catch me at Inside the HBC Sports Lab. We call it Dr. Pavilz Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington Charles Bishop. That's every Tuesday uh, and Thursday at 6 o'clock Central Standard Time. You can catch us live on Facebook. If you can't catch it live, go back on YouTube, like and subscribe. Check it out. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. That's at Dr. <laughs> Kenyatta Cavill. D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. That's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. All thank right. Thank you, Doc. All right. Thank you, man. And I'm letting everybody know. Uh, everybody catch me on Twitter. Uh HBCU Overdrive. Also, you can catch me on Instagram at the same name, HBCU Overdrive, and also on YouTube, HBCU Overdrive with Doc Holiday. Remember to like, comment, share, and subscribe. I am Doc. That's Doc. <laughs> we are out. Peace. <laughs>